Hello, good day everyone. My name is Alan Zelnick and I'll be uh, moderating today's session on pharmaceutical photostability testing for small and large molecules according to the ICH guidelines. I'll start out with a very, very brief introduction to Atlas as well as to myself, then get right into the, the program talking about the ICH guidelines, specifically as they relate to ICH Q1B photostability. I'll be discussing the difference between the option one and option two light sources that are allowed in the standard, touch on a few key topics regarding light and light measurement, uh, and then conclude the presentation with some practical considerations for sample presentation and touch on a couple of the specifics for ICHQ5C for biotechnology products. For those of you who are not familiar with Atlas Material Testing Solutions, we are the world's oldest and largest company involved with the outdoor weather durability testing of products and materials, and as such, we also uh, manufacture accelerated uh, weathering and solar simulation chambers, such as the ones that you see on the lower right-hand photograph. Also operate large outdoor exposure test sites for materials durability testing in places such as South Florida, Arizona, and a network of approximately 25 worldwide locations for materials durability testing. In terms of solar simulation, uh, we range from very, very large custom systems, such as uh, those that you see here on the left-hand side that provide full-spectrum solar simulation for the exposure of products, all the way down to small tabletop and floor model instruments, such as shown on the right, which are typically used for the photostability testing for pharmaceuticals. As for my background, I started in 1975 in uh, analytical instruments and have been in that area uh, pretty much ever since, especially regarding pharmaceutical products uh, and various instrumental methods of analysis, especially chromatographic methods and uh, polymer molecular weight characterization. Since 1994, I've been with Atlas and am presently serving as a senior consultant in uh, the company's global consulting group. So I work with designing photostability and uh, solar radiation and weathering durability testing programs for clients around the world. So having said that, let's uh, talk about photostability testing. We are concerned with photo degradation during the manufacturing, storage, transport, and even the administration of uh, parenteral pharmaceutical products to patients. As shown in this photograph here, we may have a variety of different types of light sources that a product may be exposed to. So for example, we have the uh, nurse who has removed a pharmaceutical product from its protective packaging to uh, inject into an IV bag. That material may be photosensitive. Uh, it is exposed to a combination of lights from you know, the ambient fluorescent lighting. Uh, perhaps there's also a skylight, uh, maybe even uh, a window where we have uh, direct or indirect sunlight coming through it. So the big question is twofold. One, if any of the active pharmaceutical ingredients is sensitive to the effects of light and would actually degrade, will that decrease the efficacy of the product? Uh, and then secondly, if the product does degrade, whether it is the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, or any of the excipients, could they morph into something that could potentially harm the patient? So we are interested in understanding you know, the, the toxicity as well. When we're talking about the drug universe, uh, we are principally involved with uh, talking about the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the, you know, the preparation. And the safety and efficacy of the APIs is established through an international conference on harmonization of technical requirements for registration of pharmaceuticals for human use otherwise simply abbreviated the ICH. Now the ICH has established a series of guidelines, not just photo stability, but many other types of quality guidelines and testing guidelines. These have been adopted into the uh, member countries. There are, it's called the tripartite agreement because there are three principal signatories to the ICH guidelines. But the member states of the European Union, the country of Japan, and the United States. And it's between these countries where the, the vast majority of the drug research and much of the drug manufacturing is conducted. The ICH guidelines, uh, the tripartite or three-party agreement, again, were established by a collaboration between uh, federal regulatory agencies, uh, trade associations, uh, and other interested third parties. The ICH itself has no regulatory authority. 
So what happens is that the ICH uh, establishes their guidelines and consensus. These guidelines then filter down to the various different regulatory agencies in the member states, such as the Food and Drug Administration uh, here in the United States, as an example. And then these are then enacted individually by the countries into their laws uh, in whole or in part. So the ICH guidelines, for the most part, have been adopted by the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, published in the Federal Register, and become U.S. law. Now, just because there are three essential member states, the EU, the U.S., and Japan, does not mean that other countries do not follow the ICH guidelines. The World Health Organization has their own set of, of, of standards and guidelines and has largely adopted most of the ICH guidelines uh, as well. So for those countries who follow guidelines, uh, they also indirectly follow the ICH guidelines. Uh, other member nations, such as you know, Australia and uh, others, have also adopted uh, these and have other organizations such as the veterinary ICH also has followed the ICH guide. Now there are two guidelines of, of interest. When we're dealing with uh, small traditional pharmaceutical molecules, typical drugs, the photostability testing requirements are governed by ICH Q1B, stability testing, photostability testing of new drug substances and products. When we move to the world of biotechnology products, such as proteins, peptides, monoclonal antibodies, etc., those are governed by a different uh, photostability guideline, ICHQ5C, which governs the stability testing of biotechnological or biological products. And uh, this presentation will focus primarily on the Q1B, the small molecules, and I'll just touch a little bit on the Q5C differences toward the end of the presentation. Now, when we're dealing with the, the stability testing of uh, pharmaceutical products, there are many guidelines. Some have to do with uh, temperature degradation, uh, hydrolytic instability, oxidative degradation, etc. And uh, in this presentation, we're only going to be talking specifically about photolytic degradation or photostability or photolability. As an example, uh, nifedipine, uh, which is used to treat high blood pressure, and mulcitamine for angina pectoris are uh, two pharmaceutical tablets that are known to have extreme photolability even under normal room lighting conditions. Uh, one of the more interesting aspects of these two uh, pharmaceutical products is that they exhibit something known as a bathochromic shift uh, of light absorption between the solid form and the solution form, which means that as you move from the uh, uh, the solid form, you know, to the solution form, they start absorbing light at lower wavelengths. Okay, so uh, this has some implications depending upon you know how the product is dispensed. If it is dispensed only as a solid tablet, or whether it is dissolved or, or it is a placed into an injectable or a solution, there may be a difference in the light absorption that may need to be tested separately in both forms, the solid and the liquid form. Now, in the case of the nifedipine for high blood pressure, it is photolabile uh, and is primarily degraded with wavelengths of light in the UV range, especially the higher UV range, around starting at around, you know, 400 nanometers, about the beginning of the visible range, uh, up to about 420 nanometers, uh, and that causes uh, almost all of the photo degradation. So it is uh, essentially just on the the cusp of between the UV and the visible range. The mulcitamine tablets, on the other hand, are affected only by a very short wavelength UV light starting well below 400 nanometers. The normal terrestrial uh, cut on of outdoor solar radiation is approximately 295 to 300 nanometers. And for indoor solar radiation, sunlight filtered through window glass, it typically starts anywhere, depending upon the glass thickness and type, between about 320 and 340 nanometers. So that has some implications in stability testing that I'll discuss uh, later in the program. In both of these cases of uh, tablet forms, uh, the, the light penetrates far less than one millimeter into the tablets and actually substantially less. We'll talk about sample presentation toward the end of the program and how best to, uh, to test various different products. Now, when we're talking about stability considerations, there are a number of, of stability considerations uh, that we need to assess. Uh, one is the chemical stability, 
in other words, does the active ingredient retain its integrity and its labeled potency? Uh, physical parameters, uh, including the appearance, palatability, dissolution, the suspendability of, of the tablet. We are also concerned about therapeutic concerns, that that remains unchanged, toxicological concerns, that there is no increase in toxicity. And then lastly, uh, microbiological. Of all of these, uh, only the microbiological is, is essentially not affected by light. So besides looking at the chemical potency of, of the pharmaceutical product and photostability testing, we also need to be concerned about all these other aspects uh, as well. So let's talk about some of the essential uh, definitions and testing requirements of the ICH Q1B guideline. Now one of the fundamental concepts is something called mass balance. And this is simply the process of adding together the assay values as well as the level of degradation of the uh, degraded products to see how closely all of these add up to 100% of the initial value considering uh, the margin of analytical error. In other words, if we lose some of the API from th due to photo degradation, can we detect the degradants to the point that the sum total can be of 100% can be accounted for in terms of the mass. As an example of this, uh, here we have uh, an HPLC assay after conducting 10 times the basic ICH photo degradation uh, requirements, and I'll explain what those are in just a few moments. Uh, and here we see uh, that at around 26 minutes we have our, our major API peak, but we also have a couple other smaller peaks shown here by the little red arrows. And these are, are actually the photodegraded API byproducts. So in this particular case, the potency is uh, 20, remaining of the API is 25%. So in other words, 75% of the API was photodegraded under the test conditions. The residual remaining impurities that can be detected in this HPLC assay only total 18% of uh, that value. So that means that 57% of the API degradants cannot be detected with this particular assay. So one of the, uh, so this indicates a lack of mass balance. So, you know, in your, your uh, regulatory filings, you know, one of the key aspects of the ICH requirements is not only that you understand uh, and have tested the photodegradability of the product, but also that you understand the, what the degradants are uh, and can account for the majority of them. So in this particular case, missing 57% of the API uh, is being unaccounted for is, is not really an acceptable result. So therefore, one of the key aspects of the photostability testing, there are actually two key aspects uh, that I'll describe in just a moment. But one of these aspects is a certain minimum testing requirement, but the other is a forced degradation test. This is where you may need to employ photostability testing far in excess of what the product would normally be expected to see or what the minimum requirements uh, of the test method are in order to deliberately try to degrade, photo degrade the API and in so doing to validate your stability indicating assays and show that you can account for the mass balance. So therefore you have to realize that a very important aspect of the ICH guidelines is not just the actual photostability testing itself, but also the validation of your stability indicating assays. Uh, okay. So uh, with these force degradation tests, uh, there are different tests for study the effects of heat, light, and moisture, and then some other tests are also combinations of heat and moisture, et cetera, for uh, shelf life stability testing. But we are only going to be talking about the photostability testing here. Now, Dr. Alan Templeton of Merck has proposed uh, an informal generic classification for three different levels of photostability of pharmaceutical products. Uh, he defines uh, class one as a product that does not photodegrade outside of the primary packaging, so it's a stable product. Class two is where the primary packaging does protect a photolabile product from photodegradation whatever that uh, primary packaging is, whether it's a blister pack, uh, an amber 
vial and ampule, etc. And then class three is a highly labile product uh, where the primary package in and of itself, such as a blister pack, is not sufficient to protect the product from photodegradation and some secondary packaging such as a cardboard opaque overwrap is then required. Okay, so that is kind of a, a nice general three stages of uh, levels of photostability. Now, once you are doing your photostability testing, uh, we obviously want to have some degraded API so that we can validate our stability indicating assays and prove mass balance. So in other words, since the degradant products are usually going to be present at very, very low levels, we need to have a sufficient level of photodegradation of the primary API in order to generate sufficient levels of degradants that can be detected uh, so that they're not below the, the, the minimum detectable levels of our assay. So kind of a, a good rule of thumb in photostability testing to, to prove your, uh, your assay techniques is to have a, a fairly high level of photodegradation, you know, maybe as much as about 15% API loss. If you, you get that level of API loss, but your assay cannot detect any of the degradants uh, and prove mass balance, uh, then that's a, a deceptive result. Also, if we have a, a huge amount of uh, API loss, you know, anywhere between 15 and 100% and of it, but again, uh, no relevant degradants are observed or we have inadequate you know, mass balance, that's also a useless result. So we want to have a sufficient level of degradation of the API. Again, around 15% or, or thereabouts seems to be a, a fairly good level to shoot for and at least one or all of the re relevant degradants are observed and detected in our assay, and that would be a predictive result. Okay? So again, besides the actual analytical assays, we also have to be concerned with all these other aspects, stability having to do with the appearance. So for example, if a tablet changes color, perhaps a patient may be reluctant to take the prescribed dose. The friability uh, of the tablet, uh, things like uh, dissolution time can be affected. Uh, moisture content, you know, microbial purity, you know, other degradants, you know, etc. Hardness. So we need to, to consider, you know, all aspects of uh, the product stability. Now, there's a general sequence of photostability testing. First, we typically start out with the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, and do both confirmatory as well as the forced degradation testing. Now, I briefly touched on the forced degradation testing, where we we, we simply run. The, the photostability tests, you know, under harsh conditions until we actually force degradation, even if it's excessive in terms of end use conditions. The confirmatory testing I'll discuss in just a moment. And that's the minimum requirement of ICHQ1B. So we need to test the APIs in several different forms. The raw API, the API mixed with the incipients, excipients, and then also with the, any intermediate packaging for processing validation. Then the FPP, the final pharmaceutical product, we need to do confirmatory and forced degradation testing, again, on the raw intermediate and in the final packaging, and at both the initial pilot as well as the batch scale batches. Then for confirm confirmation of provisional tentative shelf life, you need to do the other real-time stability testing, such as you know, uh, oven aging, uh, environmental chambers under controlled temperature and humidity, primarily for shelf storage. Then you also need to retest uh, all the stability tests for the final pharmaceutical product in its final form with the actual production equipment. Further, you're not done yet. Uh, you need to test the final pharmaceutical product. You, you also need to do stability testing on the first three full production batches using the production equipment, and then follow-up stability testing on at least one batch per year. So if you go to the ICHQ1B guidelines, you'll see kind of a general flow chart as to when you can exit the testing. So uh, you, you start doing your testing, and if the amount of degradation is acceptable, you can you know, then end the testing, uh, otherwise you need to continue on through the entire process. Part of the reason for this additional testing and, 
things like the intermediate and the final packaging and the final pharmaceutical form, it, is that this information then supports your regulatory filing having to deal with your packaging decisions, so that as well as the overall you know shelf life stability uh, testing. So, the, so photo stability testing is an ongoing process and not a simple you know one-time event. Now, in addition to what I've just described, you need to do additional new stability testing uh, on the API anytime there's a variation that affects the route of synthesis or anytime there's a change in plant equipment or plant location. You need to do follow-up stability testing on the final pharmaceutical product anytime there's a change in composition or a change in packaging of the FPP as well. So if we look at the life cycle uh, stability studies testing in product development, we have all of our various different stress tests, photo stability tests, studies to support our process and product development, as well as your clinical trials, uh, your shipping and in-use stability, uh, support your packaging decisions, etc. cetera, uh, inter intermediates. Then during the submission and approval stage, you have your more formal studies uh, for the applications. And then post-approval, you have your commitment batches, including you know, the first three uh, full production batches with the plant equipment. Then all of your follow-up stability testing programs once per year. And then any time there's a change in route to synthesis or change in, in production equipment or location. So let's talk more about the ICH testing itself uh, for small molecules. Now, as I said, there was a force degradation test, which we've just talked about a little bit, but there's also something called the confirmatory testing, and this is what confuses people a little bit. This is a specific minimum exposure condition and requirements. Uh, however, the ICH tells you how to conduct the test, but the acceptable degradation levels are determined by the manufacturer. And I'll show you an example of that uh, toward the end. The, the confirmatory testing is a requi minimum requirement with spe specified minimum conditions. And then the force degradation testing uh, is something that uh, you're allowed to use whatever technique is possible. So if you have a very uh, photostable product, you may need to really beat on it uh, you know, with, with fairly severe conditions to force uh, some degradation just so that you can prove your stability indicating assays, support your packaging decisions, you know, etc. So you can use some fairly severe conditions. Uh, as a general rule for photostability testing, most people will simply use the confirmatory testing requirements and simply run them, you know, three, five, or, or even ten times or more in terms of uh, length of, of testing to, to try to force uh, products to fail without having to change conditions. And again, these have also been adopted by the veterinary ICH guidelines. The ICH Q1B allows the user to select between two different light sources for photostability testing. Option one light source is any light source that is designed to reproduce the D65 or ID65 daylight emission spectra. I'll show you what those are in just a moment. These may be daylight fluorescent lamps which combine visible and ultraviolet outputs. These are very difficult to find, by the way. Uh, xenon arc lamps with proper filters, as shown here in uh, the Atlas Tabletop uh, Sun Test uh, CPS uh, photostability testing chamber, uh, or metal halide lamps of the, that generate the proper spectra. Okay. Now, D65 is the internationally recognized standard for outdoor daylight. Uh, so it's daylight 6500 Kelvin in terms of color temperature, as defined in ISO uh, 18909, formerly 10977. Okay. ID65 is the D65 spectra that has been filtered through window glass. So it is the equivalent to uh, indoor window glass filtered indirect daylight. And I'll show you what these spectra look like. Now, the xenon arc light source, uh, when properly filtered, uh, is a gas discharge lamp which has several advantages for solar simulation and is recognized as the gold standard uh, for solar simulation. It provides the, the best uh, solar simulation spectra uh, matched to daylight. 
It's extensively used in solar simulation. It can be easily filtered for various spectral conditions, such as switching between the D65 and the ID65. And it also has an advantage of being operational over a very wide uh, power or light intensity range, which gives added flexibility in testing. And I'll show you an example of that during this presentation. Uh, an example of a device would be the Atlas SunTest CPS Plus, shown here. The light source is located in the ceiling of the device along with the appropriate D65 or ID65 filters. Uh, the test specimens are then you know, placed on a sample tray, uh, and then the various reflectors and optical systems provide a high level of, of spatial uniformity over the exposure area. The uh, controls are, are computer controlled, so you can set the light intensity, the duration of the exposure so it can be run uh, unattended, uh, for example, and automatically you know, turn itself off. And there's an optional chiller attachment available so that if you have thermally labile samples, uh, we can maintain a lower test temperature uh, to accommodate them. This is what the, uh, a typical uh, t uh, instrument such as the CPS instrument I just showed you would look like, where the lamps are here, the various different optical filters providing infrared a rejection to lower the, the temperature, uh, sp the spectral the D65 and ID65 filters, and then the optical system to provide uniformity over the exposure area. So if we look at the spectral power distribution, so we are looking at light intensity uh, or radiance on the vertical axis, uh, and we are looking at uh, the wavelength along the horizontal axis. So you'll see that the spectral cut-on of terrestrial solar radiation, according to D65, is right around 295 nanometers. It then increases on up through the beginning of the, the visible spectrum. Uh, then as we start getting into the longer wavelengths out to the, the oranges and reds, it decreases in intensity a little bit. Now the ID65, or indoor daylight, has a little bit uh, higher spectral cut on. So if you look at the, where the red line is shown here, and I now move over to the ID65, we'll see that the spectral cut on is moved to about 325 nanometers and you know most of the energy below about 340 nanometers has been attenuated. Okay. So in other words, the D65 from a UV exposure standpoint is a more severe test than the ID65. So the, one of the questions is, well, when should I use ID65 or when should I use D65? Well, the answer is you can use either. Uh, both are allowed within the ICHQ1B guidelines. If, however, you are doing force degradation testing, it might be advantageous to do the D65 since it is a more severe and harsher test and more likely to produce degradants in a shorter period of time. Okay. Now, the ICH guideline also provides an option to light source. These are not manufactured by Atlas, uh, but I will we'll briefly describe them. The option two light sources use two types of fluorescent lamps. One is a cool white fluorescent lamp designed to reproduce uh, the spectra at ISO 10977, so it's a visible daylight lamp. Then it requires a second UV lamp, a separate uh, exposure using a near UV fluorescent lamp which has a peak spectral emission between 350 and 370 nanometers. Okay, and then there's some other requirements for that. Uh, in some instruments uh, it's possible to combine both of these two fluorescent lamps into uh, one instrument during one exposure, but more commonly uh, you would have uh, two separate exposures, one using the visible light cool white fluorescent lamp and then a second exposure using the UV lamp. And I'll talk more about the advantages and disadvantages in just a moment. Now, the ICHQ1B confirmatory requirement states that you must expose to the visible light for an overall illumination of not less than 1.2 million lux hours, and the UV portion of the exposure must be at least 200 watt hours per square meter. Okay. Now, this presents a bit of a complication and is uh, unfortunately an example of a standard which isn't particularly well written for several reasons. First, a confusing issue with the guideline is that it mixes radiometric terms, the 200 watt hours per square meter, for example, 
Uh, and photometric light measurements, the lux hours in the visible. So it uses two different measurement systems. And this presents some, some confusion for a lot of people. Now, when we're talking about light measurement, I've shown here for light intensity two, the different symbols uh, in units of measurement between radiometric and photometric measurements. In short, the photometric is a visible light measurement only, and it is also skewed to the res human response of, of the eye, which uh, perceives green wavelengths of light uh, to be brighter in intensity than other colors. So there is a, a human uh, response factor in here. To give you an idea of what lux ranges are, and if you're an old film photographer, you may be familiar with uh, lux meters, uh, light meters for photography. A bright sunny day, you know, out of doors in a nice sunny place such as, uh, you know, the southwest United States or the south of France or Italy uh, could easily be 100,000 lux. Typical office lighting would be around 100 lux. Museum, uh, such as, you know, the Louvre would typically be around uh, 10 lux. Uh, a full moon at night outdoors would be about 0.1 lux, and then you can see that it goes down from there. So if we multiply this uh, lux value by the duration of the exposure in hours, we end up with lux hours. And again, the visible requirement is a minimum 1.2 million lux hours. Now, the radiometric system, which is the preferred uh, measurement for science, is electromagnetic measurement of the entire spectrum or portion of thereof and is uh, independent of the human response you know, of the eye. Okay? So you use various different types of electronic detectors. You can then use that measurement and with a conversion factor convert this measurement over to lux units. Uh, but again, lux is strictly a visible light measurement whereas radiometric measurements can be over any portion of the spectrum such as just the UV portion. And in that case, we want to have 200 watt hours per meter squared. Now, uh, there are allowed in the standard something that's called a chemical actinometry measurement. And this is really an older technique which is rarely used today. Uh, but basically, the most common actinometer is a quinine sulfite dihydrate solution, which changes color in a, in a linear fashion with UV exposure. So back in the days before we had good, accurate, you know, light monitoring, uh, chemical actinometry used to be used to determine the end point uh, for the exposure. Today, uh, electronic meters of various different types are almost exclusively used, uh, but I do make, need to make one uh, cautionary point. Different photostability chambers using option one and option two will use different electronic power supplies and different ways to, to power or drive the lamps. Some lamps are AC driven with a sine wave, others are square wave driven, some are pulsed, etc. Uh, then also the detectors typically have different, you know, not only wavelength sensitivities, but also different time constants in terms of the measurement. So you must always be sure that the electronic light meter that you are using is properly calibrated for the, the nature of the light and the power supply, the way it's driven, to get an accurate measurement. Uh, I, I oftentimes am, am, am uh, questioned by people that they have, have picked up a, an off-the-shelf light meter, even a spectral radiometer, uh, placed it into a light stability chamber and get a different light intensity value than the manufacturer specifications or their meter is indicating. And this is almost always due to a calibration difference uh, between, between the systems. So uh, a cautionary note, always check with your light source or your photostability chamber manufacturer uh, regarding any recommendations on the use of third-party light meters or you may get yourself into trouble. Okay? Now, where do these uh, values of 1.2 million lux hours of visible and 200 watt hours per meter squared come from? Well, the ICH stated that the minimum visible light exposure is the, roughly the equivalent of about three months of exposure to visible light in a pharmacy, warehouse, or a home with the protective container removed from the product. Uh, why that last part? Well, very often 
consumers, uh, patients will take their, their pharmaceuticals and they will transfer them from uh, the, the factory or the pharmaceutical packaging uh, and place them into those little daily pill dispenser reminders, some of which are transparent uh, or translucent. Or they sometimes will just take them and put them into little plastic bags, you know, etc. Et Maybe leave them on on the nightstand or on on a medicine counter. So that's the reason for removing it from the protective packaging because this is what end patients oftentimes do. The UV portion of the exposure, the 200 watt hours per meter squared, is roughly the equivalent to one to two days inside, close to a window with sunlight exposure. Okay, so that's where these basically come from. Now, uh, note that the ICH guideline does not require that the visible and the UV exposures be separated. In fact, if you use the option one, they are not separated. They are both the UV and the visible light are emitted from a single light source at the same time. It's only when you're using the option two that you have the ability to do two separate exposures with the two lamps. Uh, it should you decide to do that. Okay. So technically, these are minimums and not endpoints. So there is no overexposure. Uh, so you simply have to run to the minimum of 1.2 million lux hours visible, 200 watt hours UV, and you can certainly run uh, beyond that. And in fact, most companies actually do. So understand the the robustness of the photostability of their product. Most companies will indeed run the ICH confirmatory requirements to at least to two or three times and often to five to ten times those uh, you know, 1.2 million lux hours, and et cetera, values. Uh, and, and also that data then can also be used to support your force degradation assays in many cases. Okay? Uh, now, one of the confusing aspects, however, that if you only want to run to the minimum confirmatory requirements and you are using the option one D65 or ID, 65 light source with a single lamp, such as the, the, the Xenon arc lamp, that the visible and the UV minimums are reached at different points in time. So what happens is that the visible portion, the 1.2 million lux hours, actually takes about two and a half times longer to reach the 1.2 million lux hours than it is for reaching the 200 watt hours. So here you have a choice. You can either leave in a sample to you know, the 1.2 million lux hours, in which case you will have now reached about uh, you know, 500 watt hours per meter squared of the UV, or you can put in two separate samples, pull one at the conclusion of the UV exposure and leave the visible light in until its conclusion. So the, those are your options. So again, th these are, are minimum requirements, not endpoints. Okay, so there really is no overexposure. Uh, it's just a little bit confusing that if you just want to run to the minimums, you end up with two different exposure durations for the UV and the visible. As I said, the ICH is not necessarily the best written standard, but it is what it is. Okay. Now note that these confirmatory requirements do not replace the force degradation test. Uh, to validate your stability indicating assays and your packaging decisions. Okay, Now, let's look at uh, the effects of irradiance on exposure. With the SunTest CPS to Xenon light source, there is the ability to alter the light intensity you know, over uh, you know, roughly a three-fold range. Um, so to reach the UV minimum requirement at the lowest light intensity setting, would take just about nine hours to get you to the 200 watt hours. Uh, conversely, it would only take a third of that time at the highest setting. And the same is then also true for the, the, the 1.2 million lux hours. So you can see that even at its lowest power setting, which would generate the least amount of heat, you can still reach the ICH guidelines in less than 24 hours. Uh, and if you go to a higher light intensity, you can easily achieve, you know, three times the minimum requirements you know, in, in a 24-hour time frame. So the, uh, the ability to increase the power level, light intensity level, has an advantage in being able to, to shorten the duration, the length of the test. Okay? So that's just one particular advantage 
most of the fluorescent lamps, depending upon how many lamps there are and their proximity to the samples, will not deliver as high and therefore uh, will take a longer test time, very often on the order of several days to reach the minimum requirements. Okay? And again, all these parameters are simply programmed in you know, from the electronic keyboard on these modern instruments. Okay, so it's all controlled. Now, one other aspect of being able to alter the light intensity is the ability to do what we call reciprocity failure studies. Now, as an example, here I have our, our classic examples of nifedipine and mulcitipine. We have uh, run them to the same exposure duration in terms of radiant energy using the option one light source. And we have run them at uh, three different power levels, the low level, the mid-range, and the high levels that I just showed you on the previous slide. And in the case of the nifedipine, there is no specific effect of light intensity on photodegradation, as long as I achieve the same dosage level. However, the mulcitamine does not obey a reciprocity law. In other words, at its highest light intensity setting, I have more degradation, more API loss, than I do at the lower power settings, lower light intensities. Uh, so this is a case where the reciprocity law is, is not obeyed. Uh, so this can be, a, and it's not required in the ICH guidelines to study reciprocity, but if you're really interested in your product, it is a, another useful tool at your command using the option one light source. So how, what is the relevance of these uh, D65 and ID65 to what light products are actually going to be exposed to in the production factory, in hospital, clinical settings, and in the home and pharmacy? Well, here, for example, we have uh, a typical pharmaceutical photostability testing lab uh, with a number of different, you know, chromatographic and, you know, spectroscopy instruments. Uh, but, but the issue here is that we have mixed mode lighting. We have a combination of fluorescent lamps, running some broad general lighting, maybe some high intensity discharge lamps, uh, you know, providing fill lighting, maybe metal halide lamps, perhaps there are some windows, so we're getting some sunlight filtered through window glass, etc. So this is typical of many situations where we have mixed mode lighting. One of the fundamentals is in photostability testing is that if the spectral power distribution, you know, the spectra of the test light source is different from what the product is actually going to see, well then the results may not be that relevant. Uh, however, uh, using a, a full spectrum daylight light source such as D65 is very, very useful even if a product is only going to see purely artificial light such as uh, daylight fluorescent lamps. Okay? I'm going to show you a couple slides. Don't focus on the details here. I just want to point out a couple key differences uh, between different lamps. So here we have typical fluorescent lamps. The blue line here is a daylight fluorescent lamp, and you'll see that it has uh, essentially no UV energy, and most of the uh, phosphors are designed to output light in the, the key visible portion of the spectrum here. But it has a different spectrum than the cool white fluorescent lamps or the warm white fluorescent lamps. So even with a simple you know, a light source such as a fluorescent lamp, there are substantial differences you know, between them. If I now look at other types of lighting, such as mercury vapor lamps, which are very often used on plant production floors, <clears throat> shown here in the, the green line, because they're kind of uh, uh, spike light sources rather than being continuous wave. I look at the dotted blue line, which is a typical incandescent lamp, so it starts putting out more energy in the yellow, red, orange, and infrared energy areas. And then metal halide lamps uh, used for factories a lot of times as well. And you'll see that they differ substantially. So what we typically like to do if you're trying to really understand photostability, especially to validate your packaging decisions or any required intermediate packaging during processing of your pharmaceutical product. Uh, you can do this. Uh, you can take a spectral radiometer and place it you know, in various different locations on your plant floor. Here, for example, I'm simply showing a spectral radiometer on a pharmaceutical uh, facility. 
complex, uh, and just the detector is right by the window. So we're seeing uh, some sunny skies on the west side of the building, and we are also getting some uh, fluorescent lamps uh, from overhead. And this is what the spectra looks like. I'm going to show you several of these, so don't worry about focusing on any of the details. I'm going to go through them fairly fast. I just want to point out how very different these various different light sources are. So here we have uh, one. Now I'm going to move indoors to high intensity metal halide lamps, and the spectra looks considerably different. I move to uh, indoors in a pharmacy uh, with uh, fluorescent overhead lamps in the hospital, and the spectra looks entirely different. So even though there are some of these various different types of lamps that you see here on the back side of this graph, in general the D65 and, or the uh, ID65 have a reasonably good overlap, you know, between most of these different light sources. So it is, you know, generally speaking, not perfect, but it is a, a reasonable compromise. Okay. Now, in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of the option one and option two, the option two, which is the separate visible and UV fluorescent lamps, produce a little bit less heat, so there's less of a, a need for any specialized cooling. There is typically no or very little airflow through the chambers because of they don't get very hot, so uh, you don't have any issues with powders or specimens you know being blown around. So that's an advantage. Uh, however, one disadvantage, uh, first of all, is that the exposure is prolonged because light sources are typically not that intense, so they typically take several days to reach the minimum requirements. And more importantly, there is typically an emissions gap between about 380 and 420 nanometers between the common UV and the daylight fluorescent lamps. If you recall, our nevetapine tablet uh, suffered most of its photodegradation between 400 and 420 nanometers. So if indeed you test the photostability of nevetapine or similar products using the two separate fluorescent lamps, you may get a false indication of photostability because you have a band gap right where the photostability, uh, photosensitivity of your, your test API happens to fall. So it's, it is allowed by the standards. Just be aware that that is one of the, the deficits of the option to photostability testing. The advantages, disadvantages of the option one, such as the xenon arc light source, uh, it's easy to switch between the D65 and the ID65 just by changing optical filters. Uh, the rapid exposures because of higher light intensity, typically you know less than 24 hours, even for extended testing. The near UV and the visible tests occur simultaneously. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, they do generate a little bit more heat. So you may need to take a little more precaution with photo labile samples uh, and powders. Now here we have an example of a photostability test result, a good old ibuprofen pain reliever tablets. And here you will see that the test objects uh, were, were in several different forms, the raw API, uh, uh, in solution, in amber and clear ampules, formulated in gel, both packaged and unpackaged and they were uh, run to the minimum of the UV and the visible light exposures. And this is how much of the API was remaining after the minimum confirmatory requirements. Uh, I won't go into explaining any of the details here, uh, but if you study the graph, you'll be able to, to see that uh, there's a, because of the glass filtering out some of the low wavelength UV light, uh, that you have different percentages of API loss. So by using some of this data, you can understand which portion of the spectrum, whether it was the UV or the visible, uh, and support your packaging decisions, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, it's also possible to place the samples behind UV or visible light blocking filters uh, and, and do a series of tests where you are exposing the samples uh, to different filters. Here, we block the light to the left and pass the light to the right. And these are available in roughly 100 nanometer uh, increments uh, in terms of wavelengths. Now, in terms of how to use some of this data, Dr. Alan Templeton from Merck again did uh, some very nice uh, studies uh, using and developing something called the light budget concept. Uh, what he 
did is that using photostability testing, he first understood what the rate of photo degradation in terms of API percentage loss per kilowatt hour, or kilolux hour in the visible light was. Okay? And so for the fill solution, he determined that that degradation rate was 0.017% uh, per kilolux hour. Okay? Uh, he then determined uh, what is the what maximum permissible photo degradation level, which in this case was set at 0.15 percent. He then measured the actual light intensities uh, in his production process and determined you know how long the, the API was going to be exposed unprotected to the plant lighting in process. He then determined what the maximum allowable time under those factory lighting conditions was so that he would not exceed his 0.15% uh, permissible photo degradation level and determined that the maximum exposed product exposure unprotected in plant processing was a period of 48 hours. Uh, so utilizing this, you can back calculate and you know understand if there's any any interruption in the process. You then have to protect the product, uh, you know, from light exposure. Okay, so it's a very very elegant kind of a study, and you can easily read this paper. Okay, now in moving on to the end, I want to present a couple key aspects regarding sample presentation, regardless of which type of photo stability chamber, option one or option two, you're using. The first is uh, irradiance uniformity and mapping requirements. Uh, here, this happens to be an option two fluorescent lamp chamber where the lights are in the ceiling. And you will see that we have 100% of the light intensity dead center, but we lose as much as 70% of the light in the corners of the testing chamber. So obviously, depending upon where you have your sample placed, they're going to get vastly different exposures. So you really do need to do irradiance uniformity mapping of whichever photostability chamber you're using. Many people will use uh, covered vials, uh, you know, auto sampler vials, liquid scintillation vials, etc., with caps. Uh, so you need to be aware that the cap acts like a little sun umbrella uh, and prevents the light from getting you know, to the specimen, except at an oblique angle. So depending upon where you're at, uh, you may actually be affecting the photostability requirements. So in this particular case, even though the light intensity was highest in the center of the chamber, we had the lowest API loss simply because the uh, cap acted as a sun umbrella. In the corners, uh, we had more light coming in at a diagonal oblique angle, and so we actually had the highest level of API loss, as you see here. So we need to be very careful about uh, uh, capped vials, as well as reflections. Uh, when using liquid samples uh, in small vials, such as uh, 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 the flasks or, or liquid scent vials shown here, uh, depending upon the wall thickness, uh, the angle which may reflect some of the light, as well as the surface area that is exposed, we may also get different, and the, and the path length of the liquid, we also may get different photostability values. So here we actually got the highest API uh, loss on the far right-hand side over here uh, in the liquid simulation vial covered with plastic wrap. Uh, so here we have several other sample presentations, capped vial, capped with plastic wrap, double volume with plastic wrap, so a longer path length, and then turn on its side for maximum surface area and shortest path length. Uh, and you will see that indeed this last sample, again had, as shown here on the far right, had the highest API loss. Okay? Uh, other things to be concerned with is uh, thermal lability. Uh, the ICH guideline recommends that you, you have a dark control sample such as those covered here in, uh, in aluminum foil. Uh, so these will see the same temperature as the exposed samples, which are seeing the effects of temperature and light. So by using the dark control sample, uh, we can then back out any influence of temperature uh, from the photo lability of the test specimen. 
When dealing with powders, uh, sampling becomes a very, very critical issue. You don't want to have a thick layer of powder such as in a Petri dish because only you'll get more photodegradation at the surface. So depending upon the volume that you're sampling and the ratio of surface, to bulk material, you may have a different level of indicated API loss. So you always want to have a, a almost a mono layer of, of, of powder or crystal. You know, if some people will use uh, DSC pans, have air circulation, you want to make sure the powder doesn't get blown around. So plastic wrap and then poke a few pinholes in there so you don't have any greenhouse heating effects would be useful. Controlled powder thickness apparatus, such as those shown here, where you simply put the powder in, in a controlled layer and then cover them with quartz cover glasses uh, can be very, very useful. And then also just be aware of uh, how, especially if you're using third-party light measurement devices, uh, that you, you measure not only the incident light, but also take into account uh, what we call the cosine response or any reflection off the surfaces. Uh, as well as any shading of vials. Make sure you keep a distance between them as well. And then understand the effects of any cover glasses or plastic wraps or the effects of the, the bottles that you're using because very often glass and certain plastics will uh, act as UV filters and so you'll get a lower exposure dose than you think. In conclusion, just a brief mention on ICHQ5C for biotechnology products. Uh, the key difference is that there is no confirmatory requirement. So the 1.2 million lux hours and the 200 watt hours are not requirements. There's no specific conditions or protocol, only force degradation, stress testing, and the specific requirements you know, are, between, are left to you and justified to your regulatory authorities. For example, in proteins and peptides, there are a number of amino acids that are somewhat catalyzed by light reactions, especially in combination with metals and peroxides. For example, in, in proteins, we have uh, co the conformation of the molecule is very often the result of disulfide bond linkages from uh, the sustained amino acids. We can get uh, UV or free radical degradation of breakage and cleavage of that disulfide bond and then the denaturation of the protein and loss of biological efficacy, for example, as shown here in uh, B. GH, bovine growth hormone, uh, where uh, can have a, a photo cleavage of the disulfide bond linkages. Uh, I recommend uh, these two texts for pursuing uh, your education in photostability testing, uh, one by Dr. Berchi of Eli Lilly and one by, uh, by Tonneson, are the two classic and most useful reference works uh, right now in publication. Uh, I recommend the, these two texts highly. With that, I thank you. and. Uh, Wish you a good day. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, email me. And with that, I thank you.